life. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast that follows our journey of investing. Whether you're an absolute beginner or approaching Warren Buffett status, our aim is to help break down your investing barriers from beginning to dividend. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce, and I am very excited for this episode. We have a big name guest joining us all the way from Europe, so we appreciate him uh, taking the time to, to speak to us today. Yes, it is our absolute pleasure to welcome to the Equity Mates studio, Yanis Varoufakis. Yanis, welcome. Well, thank you very much, folks. It's always too, too, very good for me to connect or reconnect with Aussies. So, <laughs> hi, Australia. So, Yanis is a Greek economist and politician. Uh, a former academic, he served as the Greek Minister of Finance from Je- uh, January to July of 2015. And we're going to cover a lot of ground today. Uh, his thoughts on COVID and the post-COVID economy, uh, as well as the future of the global economy with everything that's going on at the moment. So um, we'll kick it off with uh, a bit of an introduction, Ren. Let's take it away. Yeah, so Yanis, we always like to start these interviews with experts by hearing the story of their very first investment. We generally find there's a good story or a good lesson that can come out of it. So to kick us off today, can you tell us the story of your first investment? I will, but before I do that, let me say that um, uh, your audience uh, will be much better off if they don't take me as a model <laughs> investor. Uh, I'm, uh, as you said, an academic, so I have fantastic theories as to why one cannot make money uh, systematically. Uh, but please do not follow my lead. <laughs> this will be disastrous for your portfolio. Um, Okay, what was my first financial investment? Because everything we do in life is a form of investment. But financial investment, well, I must have been 24. I was a lecturer, a young lecturer at the University of East Anglia, Norwich in England. My rent was um, a very significant proportion of my puny university salary. And I decided it was better to, you know, get a huge mortgage, you know, <laughs> almost 100% mortgage. Um, uh, to, to, you know, to, to invest, invest, you know, to get the back to buy an apartment for me. Uh, and uh, the very risky, stupidly risky decision I made was to go for what was back then referred to as an endowment mortgage, you know, a financial product that was, was criminally insane that should never have been allowed to exist <laughs> in the sense that you only paid interest and not even the full interest, uh, hoping that um, the capital gains would uh, repay the rest. Um, so, you know, I deserve to be destroyed by that decision, uh, but I wasn't because, um, and that's where Australia comes in. Uh, <laughs> at some point, um, I got an offer from the University of Sydney uh, to, to move to Australia. And initially I said, no, why should I ever want to go to Australia? Within um, a week, I changed my mind because uh, it, 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 I, I switched on breakfast television one day and uh, it was a bicentennial b- back then. And I saw people swimming in Bodai in the middle of the <laughs> night and I was stuck in my flat um, uh, during a snowstorm. I thought, bugger this, you know, I'm going to Australia. So I sold and I made money out of this awful financial, you know, uh, uh, product. Uh, so don't do what I did. Even when I made money, it was completely a fluke. Um, so there you are, that's your story. <laughs> Love that. And well, let's let's turn to your time in Australia. You oh, were. Well, let me just add this to Sure. If I had waited for two months, I would have lost everything. I would have been, you know, um, the, the, the value of that apartment within two months went down by 70%. Wow. 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 1987. Timing is everything. There you go. <laughs> so, Black Tuesday, if you recall. <laughs> yes. Well, we went alive. But, no, um, <laughs> no. But we've heard stories. We've heard. We've heard. <laughs> So between 1989 and 2000, you you did uh, live over here in Australia and uh, became an Aussie citizen. Mm-hmm. As an economist that grew up in Greece and studied in Britain, what were your initial observations of uh, Australia's economy? What most people knew, uh, it was um, an economy driven up or down by uh, commodities um, in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, it was completely 
commodity um, linked. Uh, and I was also aware of the, uh, even then, increasing role of real estate in uh, creating this kind of uh, uh, link between the fate of houses and holes, <laughs> holes in the ground to extract the resources, and houses in which to deposit um, uh, any surplus, uh, financial surplus people had. Not a very good foundation for uh, a first world economy. Yeah, well, that idea of houses and holes uh, very is you know holds true today. I'm sure a lot of people listening uh, can understand that. Do you keep an eye on Australia's economy today? Do you do you have any thoughts on where we are still reliant sure. on houses and holes in 2022? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, Australia is uh, at the top of my list of priority countries. Primarily because, you know, um, my, my, my daughter lives and uh, uh, struggles in Australia. So <laughs> my connection with Australia is uh, um, absolutely robust and continuous. Uh, where does one start? Look, let, let, let me, since this is a financial podcast, mm. let me say that, um, you know, Australians worry about a lot of things. Uh, we all worry about a lot of things all over the world. But the one thing that you should really be worried about, or we should be worried about as an Australian too, I have the right to say that, um, <laughs> is the one thing we don't worry about too much, and that's private debt. I mean, Australia has no public debt problem, and yet there's a lot more discussion of uh, the problem of Australia's public debt, mm. which has increased uh, during COVID, uh, like everywhere else. But the real time bomb in the foundations of the Australian economy is um, private debt, uh, legislation which is bordering on the criminally insane with negative gearing, for instance. I mean, you know, try to explain negative gearing to anybody who's, who doesn't come from Australia. They, they <laughs> say, what? <laughs> You're subsidizing uh, economic rent? How crazy is that? I mean, uh, what economic doctrine supports that? None. You, you know, you can, there, there are no left-wing, right-wing, centrist economists in the world who would think that negative gearing is anything other than madness yeah. in action. Um, so private debt, private debt is the number one thing. And also, you know, let's face it, I mean, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. You know, we have a, a new government now in Canberra. Um, they have serious... Uh, intent. I don't know how serious they will be in terms of uh, their policies for dealing with the green transition, especially with, when it comes to energy. Um, Australia has to find a way of maintaining a net s uh, export surplus in terms of energy, but it must go from black and brown energy to green energy. Mm. And, you know, that re will require a very serious investment that the private sector is not going to do. Yeah, so Giannis, uh, on the not on its own. On the on the housing story, you know, we often uh, talk here about like what the end game is. You know, you mentioned negative gearing as a policy, and it seems that every political incentive is to keep pushing house prices up. In this recent election, we had one side of politics talking about the government taking equity in your house to help you buy a house. The other side the the other side saying they'd let you tap into your retirement savings to buy a house, but both sides don't want to bring the price down. They just want to give you more money to spend. It doesn't feel like there's any, it's you know, crazy, it, it, it's, it's tough to know crazy. what the end game is here. You know, you've, you've, you've studied economies around the world. Um, what, what, when you look at Australia, what, what do you think the end game is for housing? Like, or does it just keep slowly grinding up forever? There's no end game. Um, this is just petty politics. Um, caressing the ears of the middle ground and with policies that are catastrophic for the middle ground in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that Australia has is, you know, we need in Australia um, over the next two years, three years, we need one million homes. That's what we need. We need to increase supply. Mm -hmm. This is not happening, neither by the private sector nor the public sector. Yeah. Uh, so, anything that boosts demand is going to make the problem of, of, of affordability worse. And to expect the productive sectors of the economy, especially the ones that are in high-tech, what is left of the high-tech Australian industry, 
um, the ones that are going to be producing value in the future, right? To expect them to subsidize the increasing spiral of house prices in Australia is um, insane. You know, you should, you should be screaming from the rooftops. Mm. Stop doing this. Um, let's find a way of building private and public housing to the tune of one million homes to in- expand supply. Mm. That's what needs to, to happen. And, you know, um, at some point, I mean, when I moved out of Australia in 2000, as you kindly um, reminded our viewers, <laughs> um, one of the things I didn't miss I mean, I, still, I missed a lot of things about Australia, but the one thing I didn't miss was the, the dinner party, the conversations about uh, real estate. <laughs> you know, it's a nation that is caught up in a frenzy mm. of uh, orchestrated idiocy of talking about house, houses as investments. Houses should be places where we live uh, and investments should be going into the things that produce future value. Houses do not produce future value. They can produce economic rent, which comes at the expense of the dynamism of one's macroeconomy. Mm. Well, unfortunately, Ren and I aren't in the property game, but we still have uh, certainly do have dinner parties where it dominates conversation. So no- <laughs> nothing has changed over the last 20 odd years or so. <laughs> So, Giannis, um, as we mentioned a couple of times, you've, you've, you know, you're, you're an academic and you've been thrust into the spotlight in the middle of the uh, Greek debt crisis. And I think this is uh, where I sort of really certainly came across you. Um, so, are you able to tell us a bit about that time, some of the sort of key takeaways and I guess the craziness that it was? Well, actually, I would put it a, a bit more brutally than that. Uh, the only reason why I got into politics was because the Greek state went bankrupt Uh, and I could see it coming. So after I left Australia in 2000, at around 2005, 2006, I started getting very jittery about um, Wall Street, subprime mortgages. I could see that this was going to to happen. But because, you know, whenever, um, whenever the United States, Wall Street or Northern Europe catch a cold, Greece gets pneumonia, uh, and having moved to Greece, I was particularly worried about Greece. Right? I thought, okay, now I could look. I, I looked at the, the level of private debt and particularly public debt. And I thought, oh my goodness, if we have uh, you know a Wall Street collapse, which was going to happen, um, then uh, Greece is going to become a basket case. And the number one priority I had, I had no intention of entering politics. None, zero. I mean, I loathe party politics. I love politics. I loathe party politics. You can't imagine how soul-numbing and destroying it is to be a member of parliament, to be a minister. <laughs> it really is a, a fate worse than, 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 than death. <laughs> this is how I feel about it. I have very strong you know, feelings against being a politician. But, and yet I am one, right? So this is my personal drama. Um, but the reason it happened was because I, between 2006 and 2009, 2010, I, I had good relationship, a good relationship with many of the politicians who actually ruled this country, prime ministers and ministers. And all. I, I knew them. I didn't agree with them, but you know we were on reasonably good terms. And I was, I was holding private meetings with them. And I, one thing I said, I remember telling the, the then Greek prime minister George Papandreou um, in 2009, end of 2009. I said, look, you're not an economist. If you trust me about anything, let me tell you that the state that you are governing over supposedly is going to be well and truly catastrophically bankrupt within a month. Don't, I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. It's not your fault. (laughs) He had only been prime minister for a few months, right? But don't you dare take a large credit card from which to draw monies in order to pretend that you're making the repayments of the Greek state. Mm. It's like, you know, getting a credit card to repay your mortgage. You just don't do that. You know, lose the house, declare bankruptcy, embrace bankruptcy, embrace the pain of bankruptcy and start afresh. Do not take, and what does he do? He takes the largest loan in human history, 110 billion euros, which is something like, you know, 190 billion Australian dollars mm. um, for a country that is um, smaller than, uh, than what, New South Wales in terms of the economy, much smaller than New South Wales. Um, the largest loan in absolute terms, not in relative terms, the absolute largest 
loan in the history of the world on conditions of crash, crashing austerity that was guaranteed to reduce GDP further. I mean, you don't need to be an economist to know that that is crazy. You don't do that. And he did it. And the whole political establishment did it. And I, I realized that, you know, once the lenders, the official creditors, the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, and so on, the reason why they gave them that loan was they never expected to, take, to get it back, right? The reason why the foreign creditors gave them that loan was because they actually took it. They took the money from you know, poor Germans, Slov Slovaks, Portuguese, and so on, to give it to the Greek state so that the Greek state would make Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale, you know, the French and the German banks, the idiotic French and German banks, to make them whole. So it was a, a cynical transfer of money from European citizens and the weakest, because the, the strongest don't pay taxes, as we know, uh, to the German and French banks. And, the, and this was um, portrayed as a bailout of Greece. It was not a bailout of Greece. It was a, another, yet another toxic bailout for the French and German banks. And the price that the Greek population paid for that was debt bondage forever. Have you noticed what our debt to, debt to GDP ratio is today? It's 210%, right? And, and we're not Japan. I mean, Japan don't mind having 300% because they have the printing presses pr printing the yen in which their debt is denominated. We don't even have a central bank. Mm. We have a foreign currency imported from Frankfurt. So, you know, that, that you can tell why, that I'm, I'm getting agitated even <laughs> remembering all this. So at some point, a young man who was going to become prime minister soon, that was in late 2014, said, look, what you're saying is absolutely right, um, but I don't have anybody to, to, to carry out the haircut which is necessary to, to clash with the creditors on this. You've got to be minister of finance. I thought, oh, my God, I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> um, and the rest is history. So I accepted the role. I tried to do it for five, six months. Then that young man uh, surrendered to the creditors. I refused to surrender to the creditors. I resigned. And then the onus was on me to create a political party <laughs> to continue the struggle against debt bondage. So, you know, but I really dislike being a politician. <laughs> Seriously dislike it. <laughs> So the the last few years, you know, the the COVID affected years have been defined by these big financial institutions, central banks, uh, and the like. So thinking back to your time dealing with them in the mid 2010s, what did you learn about those financial institutions, the European Central Bank, the big the big private banks, the IMF, uh, and and the like? Oh, the private banks. Look, the private banks went bankrupt in two thousand and eight. The only thing that they cared for was that the state and the central bank in the United States, in Australia, in, not so much in Australia, you didn't have the same problem, thankfully, uh, in the European Union, in the United Kingdom and so on, that they refloat them, that they print enough trillions to refloat them. Once that happened, by 2009, 2010, 2012 in, in Europe, it was all done. So, the, you know, the private banks had been saved from their own hubris with taxpayers' money and central bank money. Okay, from that moment onwards, bankers, private bankers, were not in the picture. They don't give a damn. Mm. They're out of it. Um, and they, they are completely, they're they, they like, you know, zombified by the central banks. They are connected. They, there is a tube connecting them to the ECB, to the Fed and so on. The ECB, the Fed, keep pumping money into them. Um, it, it, commercial banks are not even interesting institutions anymore, right? They are, they're not players. They're not agents in this game. But what happened was that once central banks, primarily the Fed and the European Central Bank and the Bank of England, once they refloated finance, once they did that which never happened after the 1929 collapse of Wall Street, because after 1929, the banks went to the wall. They closed. The difference between 2008 and 19, 1929 was this. That, that was the one difference. The bankers were saved. But to be saved, the balance sheet of the central banks expanded magnificently. You know, lots of money printing, quantitative easing uh, is, a, is, is the official polite term. Um, <laughs> the, at, at that moment, central banks became hostages to conglomerates and to, to, to QE. It, it's, it's like, it's, it's not an addiction, it's, it's a reality. Um, since 2009, let's say, April 2009, when this uh, um, global refloating based on central bank money began, um, remember, 
governments are fiscally stressed, central banks print as if there is no tomorrow. This means money markets are, that have been doing magnificently, magnificently, because, you know, take COVID. COVID was not nothing new. COVID simply exacerbated what was happening before. Because how did the West, you know, the Atlant North Atlantic countries, Europe, America, and Britain, how did they respond to COVID? They did more of the same. They printed more money, right? Yeah. And threw it at the problem. Um, well, fine. But um, the problem has been for 13 years now that you, because of austerity, universal austerity, fiscal austerity, uh, and socialism for financial markets, because that's what it is, the state printing money and giving it to the financiers, that's socialism for the financiers, so austerity for the people and socialism for the financiers created a, a very unbalanced situation. And in particular, never before have we had so much money sloshing around in the financial sector. Never before in the history of the world. At the same time, if you compare the amount of money sloshing around the financial sector with the real investment, investment in fixed capital formation, okay? It's like that. So investment is demand for money. Liquidity is supply for money. When supply massively exceeds demand, what happens? The price keeps falling. Uh, and that's the interest rate. That's why we have, still, still today, as we speak, as you and I are speaking today, the rate of interest in, of the European Central Bank overnight is, is minus 0.7% mm -hmm. when inflation is 10%. Yeah. Right? Now, why is this happening? Because they can't do otherwise. They are caught between a rock and a hard place. If they increase interest rates, in accordance with the rate of inflation, Italy will go bust because of the whole of the Italian debt has been serviced by is being serviced by negative interest rates. Italy is bankrupt, Greece is bankrupt, Spain is bankrupt. We're all bankrupt, right? And it's only extending and pretending by the ECB. So you know, imagine being Christine Lagarde, the president of the ECB. It would be a complete nightmare. You know, what do you do? Do you increase interest rates to snuff out inflation and destroy Italy? If you destroy Italy, then Italy is out of the euro. Then the ECB ceases to exist because the ECB is the central bank of the euro. There will be no euro if Italy gets out. You know, Three trillion euros of debt will not be serviced. If that goes out, I'll tell you what will happen next. The next morning, Germany will reprint the Deutsche Mark and will leave the euro. And then what happens to the European Central Bank? <laughs> so, you know, this is the conundrum they are facing. Um, there are ways of dealing with it. There are ways of de dealing with it, and we can discuss it if you want. Uh, but the politics has been toxified so much by this combination of socialism for the financiers and austerity for everybody else that we really don't have governments capable of doing anything. They're scared of their own shadows. Mm. I mean, look at Germany. At least, you know, at least Angela, Angela Merkel used to be a strong leader. Now, do you know who the chancellor of Germany is? Yeah, okay, somebody who called Olaf Scholz. Olaf Scholz, yeah, But nobody yeah. knows anything about him. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, all right, sure. But, you know, the less he says, the better, right? Um, Emmanuel Macron is great on grandstanding, but you know, he's the president of a deficit country. Mm. So if you are presiding over a deficit country attached to a surplus country like Germany, which is leaderless, there's not much that you can do. So we are it, it, we're now suffering the nemesis out of 13 years of this hubris of refloating finance um, without reforming um, or forming a proper investment strategy. So, Yanis, uh, before the break, uh, you mentioned there that the European Central Bank can't raise their interest rates because if they do, a number of countries, Italy, Spain, Greece, would be in serious trouble. Um, so, I guess the question that comes out of that is, what, what is a central bank to do? You're in Europe at the moment. Inflation is high in Europe and around the world. What, what levers do they pull? How, how does Europe get out of this? Well, the logical policy would be threefold. I would do three things. The first thing I would do is I would increase interest rates from minus 0.7% <laughs> to 3%. Nothing huge, but 3%, you know, I mean, let's face it, um, most businesses are not paying minus 0.7%, they pay 7%. <laughs> it would be great uh, if we were paying The minus 0.7% minus... is only on, only the financiers, so that creates asset bubbles, asset bubble inflation, real estate inflation. No, let's push it to 3%. 3% is a reasonable 
interest rate to have at the moment. I wouldn't put it 7%, 3%. You know, these things, you know, um, 25 basis points here and there, go to 3%, right? And what do you do? So that, that's the first thing I would do. Second thing I would do is I would restructure the Italian, the Greek, and Spanish debt. A debt that cannot be repaid gets restructured. That's what, you know, Wall Street bankers do. Why can't we do it at the public debt level? It is, you know, this is what I was elected to do when I was finance minister, but they wouldn't let me do it. Um, if, if you cannot service a debt, okay, it is even in your creditor's interest to get it restructured so that you get something back as opposed to nothing or very little. Um, so instead of extending and pretending a debt that cannot be repaid, cut it. <laughs> you know, rationalize it. So that's the second thing. So first thing, increase interest rates to 3%. Secondly, debt restructure, private debt and public debt. Huh? And the third thing I would do, I would continue with QE. You see, I, I, this is something that, 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 that frustrates me a lot because um, historically, after 2008, they reduced interest rates to zero, hoping to stimulate the global economy after the GFC. Right? That didn't work. Of course, it wouldn't work for reasons that Keynes has explained very well. So this, then they started printing money. And because first they reduced interest rates to zero and then they printed money, they are assuming that to reverse that, first they must stop printing money and then increase interest rates, which is, I can't see why that must be the case. Mm. So, you know, we need to, to invest in green energy, right? Okay. Instead of printing money, as we have been doing for 13 years, to give to McDonald's and to <laughs> bankers, which is you know, a waste, print money, you know, to create uh, hydrogen-producing facilities. You know, hydrogen is a fantastic way of storing uh, um, renewables uh, and having uh, and convert your cement factories, your steel-producing factories, uh, in a green way. We need that. It's something humanity needs. In any case, it will create very good quality jobs. It will be scientifically very progressive. Huh? If you, you know, let's print some money for that purpose, not for extending and pretending um, unpayable loans. And at the same time, increase interest rates. So these are the three things I would do. Increase interest rates to at least 3%, uh, haircut private and public debts, and continue to print money to put it directly, directly into in the investments of good quality jobs and green energy that the world needs. Mm. So, Yanis, um, that's kind of the situation over in Europe. But, you know, during COVID, uh, the US and Australia obviously printed extraordinary amounts of money as well. And um, where, you know, as Ren said, facing uh, inflationary pressures here and, and in the States as well. So how would you, I guess, A, um, rate the response of policymakers in sort of the US and, and Australia and B, I guess our current situation doesn't seem to be as precarious as some of the countries over in Europe. But yeah, just kind of get your thoughts on how you see some of our central, well, our central bank particularly uh, making moves at the moment. Look, let me, let me concentrate on Australia, since we are in Australia, figuratively spe speaking. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I, it was a good thing that they printed a lot of money very quickly, because when you've got, uh, due to the lockdown, to, to government intervention, when a large amount of economic activity is prohibited, um, the number one priority is to prevent the short-term prohibition from turning into long-term bankruptcy. Okay? Mm. Uh, you want to save all the viable firms and families and people <laughs> um, in the short run. And if that, cost, if that requires that you should print money, you should do it. Okay, so full points on this. However, at the same time, you must think, I'm printing all this money. This money is going to go into the secular flow of income, right? At some point, the lockdown will end. This money is going to start chasing after goods and services. What goods and services? Will they be imported? Will they be home produced? Will they be brown or will they be green? Given that Australia, we mentioned that at the very beginning of our conversation, has a very serious challenge independently of COVID, of the green transition 
without which it will simply fall behind, the, you know, the developments. Because at some point, even if, um, you know, Tony Abbott becomes prime minister again and de decides to dig up everything <laughs> from, the, from, from deep within the land, right? At some point, the, even the Chinese will not be buying or the Brazilians will not be buying because the, the, the world would have moved in the direction of the green transition. So nobody will want Australian coal, even if, you know, all, every Australian becomes a, a coal miner. Um, so there was never a serious discussion in Canberra. Okay. We are turning this into a super state, a state that simultaneously locks people up <laughs> and decides to replace the labor market. So this is, you know, socialism gone mad. I'm a socialist, I don't mind that. But let's do it properly. Let's ask ourselves the question, okay, so, you know, how are we going to divert this money away from the housing market? Because if you don't do anything, this river, this Amazon of money, eventually is going to hit the real estate market. And then you're going to have, a, you know, an enhancement of the problems that we always had in Australia. And nobody thought of that. There was never any discussion of that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's So zero points on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Yanis, uh, I... We've spoken about Europe. We've spoken a little bit about Australia. I do want to ask you one question about the US because uh, in your 2011 book, you called the US the global minotaur. And uh, you spoke about how the global economy was built around some US deficits, their trade deficit, their government deficit, and that it all sort of hinged on the supremacy of the US dollar. And uh, that things started to unravel in the JFC in 2008. And I guess, uh, you know, where where we are now people are starting to question the u.s uh policy response during COVID and the amount of money they printed and because of the you know the u.s dollars status as a reserve currency and you know anything that threatens that threatens the u.s a lot so i guess uh you know given that you wrote this book a decade ago and now you're looking at the u.s today what what do you think about their economy what do you think about their status as a reserve currency i know these are big questions but um <laughs> what what happens if uh us economic hegemony starts to break down well you know this is a discussion that has been going on since the end of the 1960s um in 1970 there was a fantastic meeting in washington uh, in which a certain Mr. Henry Kissinger, who's still around and has opinions about things, <laughs> <laughs> and a certain Mr. Paul Volcker, who, la who later became the the chairman of the Federal Reserve, had a conversation, and Kissinger, who was not an economist, asked Volcker, who was, and a banker, uh, how do we maintain our hegemony, given that we are now a deficit country? Uh, same discussion. <laughs> so the United States is slipping into a deficit position since the 1960s. How can we maintain, maintain the hegemony? And Volcker said, well, um, we need to enhance deficit, trade deficit, and make other people pay for it. <laughs> this is exactly what has been happening uh, since the 1970s. So the deficit, the trade deficit of the United States is increasing. The budget deficit of the federal government is increasing. And this is the exorbitant privilege of the reserve currency and particularly of the of the United States, and that includes its military footprint around the world, that capitalists in Germany, in Holland, in Japan, and in China take 70% of their profits and send it back to the United States, um, and therefore closing the recycling loop. So this is what keeps the United States hegemonic. And even though, you know, it has fallen below 10% of global GDP from 50-something percent, right, it maintains that authority. Now, having said that, there are serious reasons to worry. It's not China, because the Chinese Communist Party apparatchiks are very smart people. Whether you like them or not, it's neither here nor there. They're very smart people. Don't forget that they have invested a trillion dollars in U.S. Treasuries. They do not want to see the dollar lose its value. They do not want the renminbi to replace the dollar. Uh, the Americans are perfectly capable of destroying the hegemony of the dollar on their own <laughs> <laughs> without the help of any adversary like China. Uh, and the, the war in the Ukraine now 
um, is a serious challenge to the authority of the dollar system. Why? Because I think they have crossed a bridge that was too far. President Biden, in his uh, urge, yearning to punish Putin, included in the sanctions one move that I think is going to be historically significant. I'm not passing judgment now on Putin. He, I have no time for Putin. He's a war criminal. He was a war criminal back in 2001, killing 250,000 Chechens. But forget the moralism here. You know, speaking financially, uh, by confiscating the reserves of the Central Bank of Russia, forcing the Central Bank of Russia to do to Western banks, they, you know, imagine having the money to pay your debt and not being allowed. <laughs> uh, that casts a very long shadow on the dollar payment system. Yeah? If you are Brazilian, Indian, uh, Nigerian, whatever, you start thinking, hang on a second, dollar safe, US treasuries, you know, are they safe in the dollar payment system? Now, if you take into consideration the fact that for its own reasons, the Chinese central bank has introduced three years ago, three years ago, a digital one, which is global because it's digital, it's like the internet. Um, a German manufacturer can now, as we speak, have a digital wallet, free digital wallet with the Chinese central bank. It's a crypto one, right? Uh, state crypto, not Bitcoin-like. Um, and he can use this, or she can use this, to buy stuff from China, sell stuff to China, to transact with people. And he can transact also through this digital wallet with Nigerians and Russians and Americans who may have these digital... Now, that is a serious threat to the dominance of the dollar. It won't happen overnight. But still central bank currencies that the Americans and the Europeans are resisting are the game to watch because they are free, they are safe, and they allow for a degree of mobility that um, bypasses commercial banks. And the war in Ukraine, inadvertently, may be what triggers a uh, you know, a shift of uh, payments from the dollar system to non-dollar systems like the the, the the electronic one. That may be a serious challenge to the global minotaur that I described in my 2011 book. And thank you for mentioning it. I still, <laughs> yeah, think that that was a, reason, a reasonably good book. <laughs> <laughs> Available in all good bookstores. Now, um, Giannis, before we uh, wrap with our final two questions that we all always ask our guests, we, we did just want to get your sort of concluding thoughts on, I guess, the broad question of where to from here. There's plenty of people in our community who are, you know, experiencing in increases in interest rates for the first time and, and going through, uh, you know, inflationary pressures that we sort of haven't seen for a decade and those sorts of things. So with everything that's kind of going on around the world and central bank responses, um, if you could just conclude with a couple of thoughts on, yeah, where to from here? Well, don't pay attention to my advice, because as I said, I am not good at giving advice. If you look at my bank account, you would know you, you don't want my advice, because I am completely and utterly, irredeemably risk averse. Um, I don't believe in risk taking. Um, I'm not a gambler. Uh, I hate gambling and I hate the stock exchange for that matter, you know. Um, I believe in safe uh, investments. I would you know, use uh, inflation indexed uh, bonds. Um, despite very low returns, uh, um, but that's me. So, for me. <laughs> fair call, fair call. Fair call. <laughs> All right, well, Giannis, uh, we want to say a massive thank you for joining us today. It's been a great conversation. I'm sure we could have spoken for twice as long, uh, but we do have two questions that we always like to finish these interviews with. Okay. So the first one is, do you have any books that you consider must-read? Oh, well, absolutely. Um, the Iliad by Homer. <laughs> you really, it's, it's, it's a very, very topical and, you know, uh, ap, um, apt book for the period that we're going through. It's all about the war, which is endless. 
Um, and most of the people involved in that are not interested in the award itself, but they're interested in making money and uh, stealing loot from one another. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great, great parable for our times. Nice, nice. <laughs> great one. I don't know if we've had the Iliad suggested before, so we'll definitely add that one to our list and people can check out the full list on our website. Uh, and then, uh, Giannis, final question. If you think back to your younger self, buying that first uh, property uh, back in the UK or maybe when you first moved out to Australia, what advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, never take advice from your older self. <laughs> <laughs> well played. <Yeah>. Well played. <laughs> we haven't had that response before, so I like that. <laughs> well, Giannis, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. As uh, Ren said, thank you so much for your time uh, this afternoon. It's uh, We've thoroughly enjoyed uh, speaking to you. We hope it's not the, the only time as well. And so uh, we so look, look forward to connecting again at some point. But thank you very much. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.